let's talk about gravity assists, falling through space, a run around some of Jupiter's moons, and the solar migration of insects. So get ready to have some pizza and let's do the science of the expanse. Season 2, Episode 11. This week has an interesting mix of a bunch of elements. We see Alex way out on the edge of Jupiter's moon Selene, waiting to do a rescue pickup for the crew back on Ganymede. The central problem is that Alex is trying to figure out how to get to Ganymede from the outer moon of Selene without being detected. He needs a way to accelerate and steer the Rosinante that doesn't use the engine so he can't be detected by the blockade. So he comes up with a plan to use gravity around the various moons to calculate an indirect path that would slingshot him towards Ganymede. This is called a gravity assist or gravity slingshot and we use it regularly in sending probes out to the solar system right now. You can see one example in this illustration of the gravity assist for the probe Juno that was launched back in 2011. It was originally launched from Earth along a long orbit that brought it back in a year to pick up a little bit of the speed from Earth and its gravity to speed it up and slingshot it out towards Jupiter. Once it approaches Earth, the gravity begins to tug at it and the satellite begins to pick up speed as if it were falling back towards Earth again. The force of gravity bends the path of the probe a bit, adds a bit of speed, and sends it flying off towards Jupiter as it passes by. I'm not going to get into the exact calculations because there are a lot of variables here. If someone watching is a physicist and wants to provide some of the exact numbers, I'd enjoy seeing them. But to illustrate the kind of potential energies we're talking about here, I wanted to show a few short calculations. The acceleration of gravity on the surface of Earth is about 9.8 meters a second. If you went out to the orbit of the moon and canceled its gravity, assuming you had no orbital velocity keeping you there, you would feel an acceleration back towards Earth at about 1.03 meters per second and begin to fall back towards its surface. The acceleration from gravity would, would increase as you approach, but just for the sake of the illustration here, let's say it stayed constant. Even with that relatively small force of gravity, you would have a velocity of about 28 kilometers per second by the time you reached Earth. Now it would take a long time, but you would have quite a bit of speed behind you by the time you got back to the planet. The forces aren't that large on Juno, but hopefully it illustrates that at the right distance and given enough time, even small forces of gravity can add a lot of velocity to a satellite and send it off in a different tra trajectory entirely. This is the theory behind what Alex is doing when he calculates the route to pick up his friends from the surface of Ganymede, and it takes us on a wild ride through the Jovian system to see a bunch of the moons. So as we said, Alex uses the moons of Jupiter to plot a gravity assist path towards Ganymede. In reality, that's something that would take weeks or months to do, so the show takes a lot of liberty in terms of how it expresses it to the viewer. That makes sense. You can't have Holden and the crew camping out with a swaddled protomolecule warrior waiting for Alex to arrive before they all starve to death. They need to convey a lot of information to the viewer in a few short scenes and keep up the pace with the action on the ground, so again, it's understandable. The scenes let us know that Alex is way out there, that he needs to sneak down to the planet, that he's using some kind of pretty slick calculation to do it, that it needs to show him passing by the moons in some way that doesn't leave the viewer, viewer thinking, well, there goes a rock and there goes another rock and, and another. So there's a lot to pack into these scenes and they do a pretty good job of it, I think. Okay, so here's another view of the simulation of Jupiter and it's many, many, many moons. It's a lot of confusion and jumble here, but the Rosinante is all the way out here at Selene, so it's on one of the most outer moons of Jupiter, and we don't know where along its track it could be. It could be much further in. You see this, you might be able to see this track sort of is elliptical and comes in much closer, but even so, it's quite a distance out there. It's nowhere near the Galilean moons, which are inside this little circle. You can see Callisto right here. That's the outermost of the Galilean moons, so it would need to fall in past these moons quite far. Um, in the show, they, they take a lot of liberty, as I said, with the moons as they show them. It would have to come through and through some of these smaller moons. Now, these are so small, you wouldn't pick up a lot of speed boost from it. You'd have to get into the, the other moons here inside the uh, inner, inner orbit of Callisto. 
and I've had some people comment to me when I talk to them during the week that they noticed that the order of the moon seemed a little bit out uh, out of order, but that's not actually true. So I wanted to point out as best I could. So Alex would have to fall in towards Jupiter, uh, give it a little initial thrust and sort of come in. And then he'd want to sort of spin around some of these other planets in a way that got him to Ganymede here. And there's a couple of paths he can take. If Callisto were in a different position, he could easily sort of fall back that pass here and we see it. We see that vision of uh, Callisto at some point in the show. Uh, he takes a, a trip peg past Callisto, heads in towards Jupiter, it looks like. Does a very close burn around Jupiter. The immense gravity of that would add a lot of speed and uh, hook it quite a bit. And then it comes out past Europa here and then in towards Ganymede. So that's a, that. the order of the moons does not have to correspond to the order of their orbits. That's actually a misconception. If people think that that's true for, um, for gravity assist orbits, that's not true. It could easily get in um, on a much more circuitous path. We see some fun shots of the other moons as he swings by them. And again, they take a lot of liberty here. They show them appearing sort of next to each other and going by quickly, when in reality they'd be very distant from one another and it would take a very long time, as we said. You can see a great shot of the moon Callisto here. Interestingly, the moon has gotten most of attention from NASA over the other moons of Jupiter. NASA has recommended a possible manned mission there for 2040. I can't describe how thrilled I would be to see something like that happen. It's a much rockier and drier moon than Ganymede used in the show, but given its distance from Jupiter, it would have a much greater protection from the radiation produced from the gas giant. We see a shot here of Europa, another one of Jupiter's moons. It's covered entirely in ice over a liquid ocean, and we can see a whole bunch of volcanoes on the surface spewing out water. A bit overemphasized in this shot, but cryovolcanoes are a very real occurrence on Ganymede and happen fairly often. The artistic license is something that Dan Abram, one of the writers of The Expanse, has blogged about a bit. He mentioned how much it pains him that they had to fudge this, but I think it's fair enough, and he's been a little hard on himself. Again, this is about getting information across to the viewer in a way that doesn't leave them confused. So in a show that already has multiple plots, multiple locations, and more characters than you can shake a stick at, I appreciate the need to conserve time and space enough to fit onto the television screen. The best part is that they tried to keep it accurate enough for us to talk about it here, and I think that's something that fans of the show appreciate. They never try to fake it. A small scene here, again mostly for narrative, but I think it illustrates something interesting about what would happen when we eventually spread out into the solar system. And it will happen eventually. We can see a character pick a butterfly cocoon as he walks by. These might be cultivated on the station to help plants grow, but it illustrates that as we move out into the solar system, we'd end up with all kinds of critters tagging along and living beside us. Particularly when we start talking about mass migration, there's almost no way to keep space sterile. And I expect we'll talk about this early era of exploration of the solar system as a kind of golden age where we could study things in pristine conditions. I just found it interesting enough to comment, but I'd like to hear what you think. Do you think we'll keep space clean? Would cosmic, cosmic rays and ionizing radiation keep things sterile for us, or do you think life would find a way out there? What about pets? Once we get out there in the kind of numbers that we're seeing on the show, I imagine people will want to take pets and even smuggle them along with them maybe. Do you think we'll see dogs and cats out there? Or do you imagine something else is more suited for life in space just for companionship? Leave a comment below and let us know what you think would happen and what life would be like out there for him. Before we wrap up today, I want to give a quick show update and some feedback. A lot of people ask me what I plan to do with the show once season two of The Expanse wraps up, and they ask if I plan to go back and do previous episodes. I'm definitely going to keep doing the show as usual, and as far as The Expanse is concerned, I'll probably do a few topical shows about things like spinning up series or expanded show on guns in space and things like that. I love The Expanse and will return to it once it comes back next year, but I plan on doing other, two, other shows too. Especially as I get better at the editing and the creation of the show, I'd love to maybe move to a two-show-a-week uh, paradigm, but right now, it's just a big challenge for me to record the show, to write it, and to edit it. So to help with future episodes, I'd love to hear from you. First, what currently running shows would you recommend that I check out? 
I've gotten a lot of feedback about going over to cover previous seasons of shows like Battlestar Galactica. I love that show, but I'm mostly interested in covering current shows, news, or movies that have interesting depictions of science in them. So send your recommendations either on the comments section or message me on the back end of my channel with your recommendations. I'd love to hear what you're finding really interesting and what would be really kind of fascinating to explore the depictions of in terms of the show. Also, I get a number of really great questions and comments uh, either on the comments here on YouTube or on Twitter. So it's made me think that I'd love to do an occasional viewer questions episode. So if we haven't covered something or you're wondering about related elements that we haven't covered before, drop me a question or comment either as a direct message here on YouTube or on Twitter and then maybe I can cover it in a future episode. If we get enough responses, I'll try to do a viewer question show maybe every month or so and talk about topics you're asking about or commenting on. I think it could be a lot of fun for everybody. I know I would enjoy doing it, and especially if it's driven by the things you're finding interesting, I really think it'd be creative and a fun way to use the time on this show. So let me know what you think, leave those comments, and I'll gather them over time and try to do a question and answer show here in, this, in the near future. That's it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed it, it would help me a lot if you please click the like button below. If you want to catch future episodes, be sure to click the subscribe button, and for notifications, click the bell icon next to it to subscribe to get pop-ups when I post a new show every week. If you think your friends might enjoy the show, please click the share button below and tell them about it on Facebook and Twitter. As always, I'd love to hear your comments on what you've heard today, what you enjoyed, if you let something out, or if you have something to add. If you've gotten this far, use the hashtag pizza party in the comments, and I know you've gotten all the way to the end. You can also follow me on Twitter at Streamweaver and leave a comment there. Thanks for joining me. I look forward to your theories this week, and as always, stay curious.